the first thing that I would like to do is I would like to thank you all very much for having me in your church home. Um, we've been planning this for a few months, and I've been very excited about meeting everyone here. Um, I'm also very thankful for everyone coming out on a Friday evening. One of the things that I want to share with you tonight, and the most important thing, is our Savior. When I grew up as a kid, I believed in Jesus. I believed in God. I believed in Jesus and I believed in God with all my heart. But there's a difference be between believing and knowing. You can believe something is true, but when you see it and you feel it and you experience it, there's a big difference. Knowing in your heart. You can believe with your head, but you know in your heart. Um, what we're going to be sharing with you tonight, let's see if we can get this thing on. There we go. If you can bring that up a little bit. What we're going to be sharing with you tonight is a testimony that started 25 years ago. When I was a, a young man, I was 12 years old, my mom and dad went through a divorce. And there's so many divorces nowadays that happen. Right now they're saying that over 62% of everyone that gets married divorces. So when I was 12, my mom and dad, for whatever reason, they felt that they couldn't live together anymore and my dad left. My dad went to Saudi Arabia for a couple of years and worked there as an architect and engineer. And me and my brother stayed with my mom. I didn't realize it until just within the past two years, but that event of my dad leaving started a chain of events in my life that led me far away from the Lord. The Bible teaches us that a father is to represent to his children and his family what the Almighty is supposed to be like. And the Almighty is powerful. That's why he is called God Almighty. Um, and I hope you all will be patient with me. Um, I'm used to using some of the Hebrew names, so I'm going to mix those you know, in between. Um, when I say the word Yahweh, that is the Father, God Almighty. When I say Yahshua, that is the Son of God Almighty. So if you all don't mind, I'll, I'll use those intermixed. Um, but because my dad had left my life, I was looking for that position, that power in my life. A father represents power. He represents authority. He represents um, stability and strength to his family, to a wife as well as a child. And because my dad had left, I knew he still loved me, but because he wasn't there to show me that power, um, the church that I was in, they taught good things, but I didn't see power there. I saw people that believed things, but didn't live them. I saw people that said they believed that Jesus Christ saved them from their sins, but yet they still stumbled and, and fell every day. And I thought, this can't be real. If this is real, if church is real and God is real, then how come I don't see power there? So at 14 years old, I began looking for a place that I could find real power. And my mom and my brother and I were, uh, we didn't have very much money. And I had seen some people doing demonstrations of martial arts, and it looked powerful to me. So that's what, I, that's what went through my mind. I thought, if I can get involved with those kind of people, I can learn that type of power power to not, you know, have to worry or fear when I'm at school about getting beat up or bullied or pushed around. Um, so I started looking for a martial arts school. And since we didn't have money, I found a school that charged a dollar a night. One dollar a night. And I thought, that's worth a try. And my mom said, you'll never learn anything there. If, it's, if they're only charging a dollar, they can't be teaching anything that's good. And I went there the first night and I got beat up pretty bad by a little girl that was about this tall. And uh, it's funny when I think back now because they did kung fu, but they also did full contact Chinese boxing. 
So and we box. When we hit, it wasn't with pads and headgear. You, you had boxing gloves on, and that was it. And uh, I spent 22 years at that school. And what I'm going to share with you tonight is some of the experience of what happened being in that school and then how the Lord pulled me out of what I'd gotten involved in. The school that I started at, it was a dollar a night. There was never any charge for making rank or belts. You never got charged for that. There was only four belts. You had white, which was a beginner. You had green, which was intermediate. You had brown, and then you had black. When I started there, there had only been three men in over 20 years that made black. Green belt, there had been less than 24 people make green belt in 20 years. So I thought, that's what I want. That's my goal, is I want green. And the only way that you could make green was to be able to beat everybody else that was a white belt. Everybody. The person that could win against every other white belt, they got moved up. The person that could beat all the green belts, they moved to brown. The person that could defeat all the brown belts, they moved up to black. And so what happened was is I started a life of conquering others in order to get ahead. And we see that today even in the business world. You know, the only way to get ahead is to step on the people that are around you. And the school that I started in claimed to be a Christian school. They taught Bible verses every night. But on one hand, they were saying one thing, but what they were teaching us was completely opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Anyway, I made green belt in 11 and a half months. Most people, it took two years, and it wasn't because I was anything great, but I was that determined. I was so tired of getting beat on and pounded on at school, I wanted my rank really bad. So I went four days a week, and I was there usually from 6 o'clock in the evening until 12 o'clock at night, six hours a day. And I trained nonstop. And I made green belt in 11 months, and then the Lord sent the first um, detour in my life to get me out of that. My dad offered me a chance to come live with him and go to college. He said he'd pay for my college. So I moved right outside Chattanooga to a place called Cleveland, Tennessee, and I lived there for seven years. While I was there, I mean, the week that I got there, I said, I've got to find another martial arts school. And I had been told at my first school that there's no other schools in Tennessee or in this part of the country that are as good as ours because they, they believed in really fighting. And... I found another school that, that did the same thing, and that was uh, a Bondo school. And Bondo is a Burmese art. They come from Burma, and it's a mixture of Chinese arts and Japanese arts and Okinawan arts. But I was in the Bondo school for about four years before I got my first rank. And the first rank that they promoted me to was a brown belt because they knew that I already had experience. Um, I went to a national kickboxing tournament and I won first place. And when I got back from that, they promoted me to black belt. And that was the first step that I took to really going into the dark side. After you reach black belt, that's when everything um, changes in the martial arts. And it's funny because normally we think of white as being purity and holiness. The Bible talks about the angels being with white robes and us having white robes and Yeshua, our Savior, riding on a white horse. But in the martial arts, you start with white, pure and innocent, and you graduate to black, which is dark. Um, and that's the goal for everyone. Anyway, after, after that tournament, and I'm just going to show some of these, that way if anybody has a question about them, those were certificates I had gotten. After I won that tournament and I made my black belt, I went back to this place. This was my first martial arts school. This was their symbol. Um, it was called Fire and Water Kung Fu. And they taught all different styles. And I went back to this school, and my instructor remembered me. It had been about seven years since I'd seen him or talked to him. And I thought, you know, I hope he doesn't know that I made black belt somewhere else. Because then he'll put me in here with some of these guys that are brown belts, and I'll get you know, my tail or my hind end whipped. Um, but anyway, without me knowing it, someone had told him that I'd made black belt at another school. So that night that I showed up, he put me with a, a brown belt, and I did get my hind end whipped or kicked really well. But after that, um, after that meeting with that other brown belt, 
I was more motivated because I said, I made black belt in this style, but what they've got at this place is better. So I need to make my rank here. I need to go for a black belt here. It took me 14 years to make black belt in this school. Um, I need to tell a little bit of, of what it was like. When I say that we did full contact, we did full contact with boxing gloves on. Um, I've seen people with their arms broke, with many concussions. I've seen people with their jaws broke at class. Um, and we fought full contact after green without gloves, empty hand. We were allowed to hit each other in the face. We kicked each other. We didn't touch the knees or the groin. We kicked each other and hit each other as hard as we could to try to prove that we were number one. And we did that for years. And the whole time that I was doing that, I was also hearing Bible verses. And the Lord kept putting up little red flags. And I kept thinking, you know, there's something that's just not right about this. But I did like the power that I was um, coming in contact with. I started being respected by people at school. There was, you know, we had 250 students at this school. The students there respected me. I had authority over other people as I moved up in rank. So that was what I was looking for. I was looking for something that gave me power. This was my instructor, and this was the night that I made my black belt after 14 years of training under him. And the reason that I show this picture is because as you see some of these pictures I'm going to show you as I progressed in time, notice the eyes. You can always tell a person by their eyes. You always know what's in someone's heart when you look in their eyes. And you guys know that. If you're dating a girl or if you're married to a girl, you can tell when she really loves you by her eyes. She doesn't have to say a word. But when you look into a martial artist's eyes, you'll see something else. You don't see something that tells you of Jesus Christ. And when you look at that, you can tell by my instructor's face and mine, the only thing that mattered to us was number one. Be number one at all cost. This was at one of the tournaments that we were holding. Um, we taught a lot of young people. Right now, today, in the United States, martial arts is growing so fast, especially since the 1970s. And as martial arts is growing, they pull in young people. Most of the students that we had at the school that I trained at there in Tennessee, most of the students were between the ages of 15 and 25. We had very few students that were over 25 years old. One of the reasons that, that that was that way was because people between the ages of 15 and 25 are very impressionable. They're looking for a leader. They're looking for someone to admire, someone to look up to. And it got to the point where all of the students at the school, we looked at the instructor as though he was our father or as though he was God. If he said, this is what you should eat, we all went home and ate it. If he said, this is how you should dress, we all went home and dressed that way. If he said, this is how you should, you know, uh, what type of movies you should watch, or whatever he said, that's what we did because we wanted to be like him. And the problem is, that's what we're supposed to do with our Savior. We're supposed to see Yeshua, Jesus Christ, and say, that's what I want to be like. But rather than that, we were looking to a man. And these young people, they got to the point where they looked to me for an example. There was always a lot of responsibility because you always had people, you know, watching you. When I would go out to the mall, people would come up I'd never even seen before. And they'd say, oh, I, I remember seeing you. Or I remember watching you in a fight. And it's so good to meet you. And they'd shake my hand. And it got to the point where it just kept feeding the ego. It always fed your ego to where your pride grew and you thought you were better than other people. I made black belt in full context Chinese boxing. This was the, the next system that I began to train in. This was, let's see if anybody here recognizes that symbol. Does anybody here recognize that? That's the Filipino, Kali, or Filipino Escrima. Is anybody here familiar with that? I saw a, a gentleman who became one of my best friends do a demonstration with Filipino Kali or Escrima. And what I saw him do with his hands and with knives and with sticks was beautiful. And I said, I'd really like to learn how to do that. And since I'd already made black belt in a couple of other styles, I started training with him. 
And he lives in Atlanta now, has a big school, about a 7,000 square foot building, trained with people all over the United States. But even in this system, I'm going to back this up a little bit, Every system that I trained in had a, a symbol that represented their style. And when you look at this, you see the triangle, and then you see a triangle within it. The symbols always represent something hidden. I want you just to notice that as we go through some of these pictures. This symbol, you see the Philippine on the right, and then you also see the Chinese yin and yang on the left. After I made black in the Filipino system, I started really pursuing rank in a system called Tai Chi Quan or Tai Chi Chung. Are you all familiar with that system? A lot of people see Tai Chi, it's, it's very slow, and they say it's good for relaxation, it's good for breathing. Um, it's promoted as a health benefit. It's promoted as something that will build your health, give you more flexibility. But what they don't tell you is, is it's all based on Taoist ideas, and Taoism is based on the yin and yang, or the yin and yang, depending on where you're from. But in the Chinese system of Tai Chi, I made black after about five years an instructor level. And then I began training in a system called Aikido. Has anyone here heard of Aikido before? Steven Seagal, does anybody know who that is? He does Aikido. Because of my training in the Tai Chi, I was learning all these Taoist principles of what they call yin and yang, opposites. And what they teach in yin and yang or in Taoism is, is that everything exists because it has an opposite. They say you have male and female, two halves of one. They say you have light and darkness, good and evil, hard and soft. Um, the problem with that is, though, is that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says that God Almighty is light and in him is no darkness at all. No darkness at all. The Taoists teach that you can't have light unless darkness exists. And that's scary because that's saying that both of them are equal. That you have to have the bad in order to have the good. That you have to have sour so that you know what sweet tastes like. The problem is though is when that follows through and you start looking at the scripture from that, that's saying that you have to have the devil in order for there to be God. And it also teaches that they are both one and the same, just two different aspects of the same being. The Aikido system is a Japanese system. And the reason that I started training in Aikido was because they taught the same principle. They taught the principle of soft movement instead of hard movement. This symbol, the reason I did this, one of my students that made black under me, um, he drew this for me to put up at the school. And that symbol that you see on the Japanese flag, do we have anybody here from Japan? Do you, know, do you know what the red circle is on the Japanese flag? The sun. That's right, the sun. And there's not anything wrong with the sunshine. But when you start realizing that that philosophy is embedded in every martial art, the sun, the sun god, that is what that symbol says. That symbol says that these practitioners of martial arts gain their power by what's behind them. The power behind the art is the sun. This was the founder of Aikido. His name was Moriai Ueshiba. And what he's doing with his hand is he's holding out the hand and he's saying all the power of the universe is in your hand. And the Japanese call that power ki. The Chinese call it chi. Uh, the Indian from India, they call it prana. But they say that that energy is Tao, or yin and yang, that that energy is in everything. Every one of us have it, and all we have to do is release it. And so the, all the training in the Chinese Kung Fu and in the Japanese Aikido is to teach you how to release this power that they say that you have within you. And the first school that I began training at, the, the Chinese Kung Fu school, there was one guy when I started there that was a black belt. And he, when he fought, he could fight three or four green belts at one time and usually within one minute defeat all of them in 60 seconds. Either that or they would be so scared they'd run because of the look in his eyes. There was one man above him, and that was my instructor. 
And he could do things using the chi or this energy that they say we have within us that amazed people. I saw him one time take his arm and set it on top of another person's shoulder, and one of our students that weighed 280 pounds dangled, held onto his arm and dangled and supported himself on his arm and didn't, didn't bend the arm at all. I saw him take one hand and pick up 250-pound bags, like a boxing bag, pick it up with one hand, and then just throw it down like it was nothing. That was the kind of power that I was after. I thought, if you can do that, you can do anything. That's what this man taught. He said, the power of the universe is in your hand. That energy, which is it's everywhere now. You watch any sort of TV programs, sitcoms, video games, music, anything out there, they're all talking about this energy or this force. That was why I began training under him, as I thought that would be a quicker way to learn. After 17 years in Chinese Kung Fu, I received a sash, which was called a, a disciple-level sash. And it's funny that the martial arts, especially the Chinese martial arts, use the same terminology that we use scripturally. What does the Bible say about calling people a master? It says, call no man master. You have one master, even Jesus Christ. And he says, call no man father. You have one father, even Yahweh, or God Almighty. But in the martial arts, everyone is under a master. And when you became very close to that master, and you had dedicated your life to the martial arts, you were awarded a rank of disciple. Myself and one other man, he's been doing martial arts for about 10 years longer than me. been doing it for 35 years. We received this rank um, after 17 years of training. And this was a rank that no one else in that school or that style had ever received. And this said that we had dedicated our lives to the martial arts rather than us dedicating our lives to the Savior. Now you'll notice I'm smiling, and normally I don't smile that big because um, in the martial arts you're supposed to look rough and scare people, but they told me I had to smile because I was with children. Um, the Bible says that the devil himself appears as an angel of light. He doesn't come to us uh, nasty and ugly. He always looks like something good. With the martial arts, they do the same thing. I did it for years. You're teaching kids, you talk to them about self-defense, you talk to them about self-confidence, about building their self-esteem, and you're smiling, and the children say, man, this is great. But actually, what you're learning at a martial arts dojo or at a, a temple, like they call it in China, is what they should be learning at home and in their church. The power is the same. Martial arts is based on spiritual power. Church is based on spiritual power. And unfortunately, these days, we don't see a lot of power in the church because so few people are hungry and thirsty for it. It took me 14 years to make black. It took 17 years to make disciple. One of the things that I had to do to make disciple, one of the primary things, was we had to learn how to make our hands hot or cold within a few seconds. And the first time that I was told that, I said, how? I mean, how can I change my body temperature? And my instructor told me, with your mind, it's always the mind over the body. And I said, okay, well, give me more information. How do I do this? Meditate. Think about it. So we'd go outside in the wintertime when it's 35 or 40 degrees, and we'd stand in a stance, look like this. And you'd stand there for an hour, sometimes two hours, and you'd breathe. And you'd meditate, and you'd think, make my hands hot, make my hands cold. One day, I'd been outside for about an hour and a half working on this. And my instructor came outside, and he touched my hands and my forehead. And it was about probably 48, 50 degrees that day, and I, I was drenched in sweat. Hadn't done anything except stand there and breathe and think. And I was drenched in sweat. And he smiled at me and said, that's good, come inside. So the next week, he put me back out there again to test me again. And this time he told me, I want you to make your right hand hot and make the left hand cold. And I thought, there's no way. Doubt. Doubt.
But then I thought, you know, I did that other thing. I did that other thing. I can do this. And then I heard a voice in the back of my head say, you can do this. I trained it, and within a few weeks, I was able to make the right hand hot, and I'm hot, like broke out in sweat, and the left hand would have chill bumps all over it, freezing cold. And then my instructor, he was really happy as he saw that progress. He came out one day and he said, okay. He felt to my right hand and it was burning up. He said, I want you to take your ring finger and make your ring finger cold. The rest of the hand has to stay hot. The ring finger has to stay cold. And I thought, no problem. And I willed that to happen. And it happened within a few minutes. My left finger was freezing cold, the ring finger. The rest of the hand was burning up hot. And you say, well, what good does that do in martial arts? They don't teach that in the beginning. I'd been doing that almost 17 years. They don't teach that to the kids at Taekwondo Plus or at the Ishinru Karate School. But they teach that after black. It's about mind over the body. The problem with that is, is who's controlling the mind? Who's in the driver's seat? I never asked those questions. I never asked, who is it that's giving me this power and this ability to do this? A little while after that, me and that other gentleman received that rank of disciple. Then I met this man. This man could do things that my other instructor, it made my other instructor look like he couldn't do anything. Um, when I met this guy, he came up to me, and I remember to this day, it was 13 years ago, he came up to me. It was at a, a seminar that he was giving out at a park in Chattanooga. And I really wanted to meet him because I'd seen some of the things he could do and I'd heard a lot about him. This man was a tenth degree in two styles of Kung Fu. He was a grandmaster in two styles of Kung Fu. It's hard to be a grandmaster in one style. That takes usually 40 to 50 years. And even then it's unheard of. He had two certificates this big with all sorts of grandmaster seals and signatures all over them. And this man came up to me when uh, my friend introduced me, and he shook my hand. And when he shook my hand, I felt something. I felt uh, something connect us. And he looked at me in the eyes, and he said, we've met for a reason. And then he walked off. And that stuck with me for the next 13 years. I never forgot him saying that because all of a sudden it was like, um, remember the cartoons where you dangle the carrot in front of the bunny rabbit and you keep moving the carrot and the bunny rabbit keeps moving? When that man said that, that's what it was like to me. It was like, oh my goodness, he's interested in me. He thinks I'm important. He thinks there's a reason for us meeting. So I did everything I could to train under him. I started training with him when he would give seminars because he wouldn't teach people personally um, unless you had demonstrated your ability and your loyalty. So I started going to as many seminars as I could. And he finally accepted me as a personal student. And he began to really teach me about what Kung Fu was about. When I went to his house to train, he had a, a studio at his home. One of the things that I noticed, first time that I was in his home, I was expecting there to be all these pictures of these Chinese warriors and Buddhist monks at the Shaolin Temple, and he only had one. He had one picture that I can remember of a, a Buddhist monk. All the other pictures in his home were Hindu from India. All the other pictures were from India. Hindu gods, Hindu warriors. And I never asked him because when you're talking to a Grand Master, you never ask anything. You don't ask unless you're asked to ask. You just listen and you say, yes, sir, and you do what they say. But I kept paying attention to the things that he taught me. And he began to teach me what that first man in Aikido talked about, the energy, the power of the universe in your hand. He began to teach me how to do that. And it got to the point with my students, when I was training, you could take your hands and you could actually form an electrical ball in your hands. And having people come in, even that weren't students, they'd stand there and shut their eyes. I wouldn't tell them what I was going to do. I'd just say, just stand there and close your eyes and tell me what you feel. And I'd shake my arms out like this, and I'd put that energy, that chi, into my hands. And the, the greater that energy got, the bigger the ball you could form. When you start, you feel it like this, and then it grows. 
I got my hands like this, and I could take my hands and just go to the side of their head, and it would push them back, even off of their feet. Back about two years ago, some of the students that I had would be from here to the wall, and they'd shut their eyes, and I could push them with my hand. Or if they'd reach for me or start walking towards me, I could hold my hand up and stop them. These are things that we see in the movies. I mean, how many of y'all have seen Star Wars? Okay, I watched it. I know I probably shouldn't have, but those are the things that you see in the films. And people say, well, it's, it's make-believe. It's not real. It is real. That's why they put it in the movies, is to, to make us think about those things and make us long for that kind of power. When it got to the point that I was doing that to people, it didn't matter. Fighting, you don't have to fight anybody. Somebody would, you know, reach for you and you'd block them and it would hurt them so much from you putting your arm up to block it that they didn't want to fight anymore. We used to do a, a type of training at the school. It was called pain class. And the first session that you would do with pain class with, uh, with usually a green belt or a, a brown belt, you'd have two partners face each other and my partner over here, he'd hit me on the shoulder. So I'd hit him back on the shoulder. And he'd say harder, and I'd hit him harder, and he'd hit me harder. And we'd go back and forth until one of us said quit. Now, if you get two guys that are pumped full of testosterone, which one of them is going to say stop? I mean, neither one of them do. You keep pushing yourself to go farther. And then we'd go to the face. You'd start smacking the face. So I'd smack him on the face, and he'd smack me on the face. And it would start off, you know, like that. But after a few moments, we would be smacking each other with an open palm as hard as we could. And you build up this quote-unquote energy so you don't feel it. After you got to that point, then we began using boards. And we would start with um, half-inch oak or hickory boards. And you'd take one about four feet long, and you'd strike each other in the, in the arms, you'd strike each other on the thighs, and you'd strike each other in the stomach. And it's training your mind to control your body. At least that's what they tell us. After you graduated past that, we started using two-by-fours and boat oars. And we got to the point where you could shatter a two-by-four. Somebody would swing the two-by-four at you, and you'd put your arm up, and it would break the two-by-four. And it wouldn't even leave a bruise on your body. Now, I'm telling you, after 25 years of doing this, that's impossible physically. Spiritually, it's, when I say spiritually, I mean through the occult, it's very possible. But that's not physically possible unless you have either divine intervention, Yahweh, God is on your side, or unless you have Lucifer on your side. So he began to teach me how to use this power. This is a picture of um, what they call the chakras, the energy centers in the body. I asked him, after a few years of training under him, I finally got the guts up to ask him about why he had all these pictures of the Hindu gods and the Hindu warriors instead of the Chinese. And he told me, he said, Eric, he said, where did the Chinese get Kung Fu from? I said, the Shaolin Temple. He said, but where did the Shaolin Temple get it from? I said, a man named Da Mo or Bodhidharma. Well, Bodhidharma was Indian. He was Hindu. And he was the one that brought this idea of energy to China. Now, when he did that, he talked about these seven energy centers in the body. One was on the crown. One was here. That's really important to remember for what we're going to talk about tomorrow. This is called the third eye. Um, how many of you all have ever seen, a, like, a picture or a, a drawing of a cyclops? You all remember that? They had one eye. It was right in the middle. The Bible says this is where the seal of the Almighty goes. In here, to the Chinese and to the Hindu, to the Indian people, this is the most powerful place in the human body. This is where all that energy, that chi or that spiritual energy comes from, is here. And he told me, he said, the Indian people, the Hindus, they believe that we have something down here in our belly, approximately two or three inches below the navel, that gives us power. And that power, that energy, is called the kundalini, or the serpent force. And the whole goal in martial arts is to make that serpent, instead of living down here below your navel, travel up your spine and live here between your eyes. Now, when he told me that, I knew something was not right about that because we are told from Mrs. White that everything down here is called base passions, hunger, food, 
um, self-defense, anger, rage, all of that comes from down here. Why would I want the serpent, who the Bible says Jesus Christ is going to crush his head, why would I want to let him come up here and live in my mind? But that's what the goal was. So they taught about these different energy centers on the body and how to move energy or chi from down here up through the body. Now one thing that I would like to really warn you guys about, yoga. Um, when I was first introduced to yoga, you think, well, it's good for stretching, it's good for health, it's good for breathing. Look up what the word yoga means. The word yoga in Indian language or in Hinduism means yoking. It means to yoke, to join the man or the practitioner, the woman, with Brahma, which is the Hindu god. So when you say yoga, you are talking about the joining of a god, a false god, with the human practitioner. And that's where they get the same energy from. They say by joining him, by receiving this god or this demon spirit, you are given power. This symbol right here, do we have anybody that reads Chinese? Great. A great red dragon. How many of you guys have been to a Chinese restaurant? How many dragons do you see in a Chinese restaurant? Okay, martial arts schools. How many dragons do you see? Everywhere. The reason why is the dragon is the symbol of power. It is the symbol of power in the Chinese and in the Japanese mind and in the Hindu mind. That dragon, that's where the power comes from. When I began training in martial arts, um, especially in Kung Fu, the reason I liked them is they did something called animal boxing. That means you act like an animal, which is kind of weird because God says we're above the animals. Why would I want to? That's kind of like being in college and somebody saying act like a three-year-old. Why would you do that, you know? We were made so much higher than the animals, but yet the Shaolin monks and the Kung Fu teachers train people how to become like that animal. Usually the first animal that somebody picks is something that um, resembles their personality or their build. So it's kind of fun. People get excited about it and they say, well, I look like a white crane because I'm skinny and slender, or maybe I'm like a snake, or maybe I'm more like a tiger, or maybe if I'm a big husky guy, I'm like a bear. So they, they personalize what that instructor is telling them, and they begin to imitate that when they spar. The problem is, though, is, is as you go through those animals, learning how to mimic them, the greatest goal that the Kung Fu teachers tell you is don't just imitate the animal, become the animal. And when you would see people, there were people in the last 10 years that I trained with, and you could watch uh, somebody that was a green belt that maybe had three or four years experience, and they'd get out there and they'd move like an eagle, or they would act like a tiger. But then you'd see somebody that had done it for 10 years, and when you looked in their eyes, they were that animal. There was something else that had possessed their, their eyes and their mind. You could look into the eyes. Um, there was one man that I trained, his name was... Well, I'm not going to worry about names um, since this is on film. But he had done Cobra style for about 12 years. And you could get out there. I could put somebody out there with him, and you look in his eyes, and you were looking into the eyes of a snake. He was not there at all. And they could go in and out of it in a second. The bad thing was is usually that spirit or that animal would, would get there when they got hit. You'd be out there sparring and pretending, you know, punching and kicking, having fun. And then all of a sudden, smack, right on the face, and you'd see the change in their eyes instantly. You could see it in a flash. It's the same way in, in a fight. You can see God's spirit and the devil's spirit. You know, you've got a, a nice, you know, gentleman at a restaurant or something, and somebody comes up and, you know, bumps his, you know, his car or says something to him, and you'll see the eyes change instantly. That's the spirit, whether it's God's spirit or whether it's Lucifer's spirit that takes possession of us. This is the spirit that I was taught is behind everything. That dragon, the great red dragon that we know from the Bible, that spirit is the spirit that gives the power to the practitioners. I'm going to talk a, a little bit about this. This is the yin and yang symbol. I know everyone's familiar with that. 
where you have darkness on one side and light on the other, and there's a little bit of darkness in the light, and there's a little bit of light in the darkness. Can you apply that to God Almighty? There is no darkness in Him. There's no bad in Him. He is light. But this is what the Taoists and the Buddhists say is God. They say this energy is the force of the universe. New Agers teach that this is God. God is just an, an energy. It's just a spiritual energy that all of us can tap into. They don't think that God is a personal being. This sh shape and symbol began with this symbol. I'm going to leave that up there for just a moment. I need to backtrack a little bit before I get into this. 1983 was when I started in martial arts. 1993, I met my wife, and we got married. And I wish she could be here with me tonight. Maybe if we get a chance to come back out, um, we can bring her with me. But 1993, we got married. In 2003, we got divorced. Um, I had two kids. I had a little boy that was three, and I had a little girl that was six. And... My wife and I had went through so much in our home, we never yelled at each other, but there was always tension, always. It got to the point where I would rather be at work than home because there was tension. And at work I didn't have tension, so I just stayed at work instead of being at home. And anyway, I don't want to run this out too long, but it got, it got to the point where I just gave up. I'd prayed for six months, I mean six months, called my mom because she's a Christian, a good Adventist lady, and I said, Mom, I need help. I don't know what to do. The Bible says I can't get divorced, but yet I'm miserable living with my wife. What am I supposed to do? And she would pray with me, and I would pray. And uh, rather than me listening to the Lord, I listened to my heart, and I did what I wanted. It got to the point where I was just so fed up, I said, I don't care. I gave up on God. I said, you know what? I've asked you for help. I haven't heard an answer. I'm getting divorced, and if you're going to condemn me for that, I don't want nothing to do with you. That was in 2003. During the time that I was divorced, um, I began to see somebody. And it got to the point over a three-year period that I was ready to get remarried. The whole time that my wife and I were separated and divorced, she didn't go out on dates. She didn't see anybody. She fasted and she prayed for me to come home. And because of what the Lord did through hearing her prayers, last August we were remarried after five years. But the reason I'm telling you this is because while we were still divorced, um, she would come over like once a week and bring the kids over to stay with me. And usually she'd say something to me that made me angry, like she'd say something about God loves me and God still loves me and I need to start coming back to church and... Um, I hadn't turned into a heathen completely, but I just wasn't interested in God. I didn't read my Bible. I didn't pray anymore because I thought, you know, you didn't hear me when I asked you to stop the divorce, and there's no sense wasting my time now. Um, well, one day she came over and she said a friend of ours, who we had known when we were still married, had given her a videotape, and she said, he told me to give this to you. I said, what's it about? She said, I don't know. I don't ever watch them. She said, I figured you like it because you like watching spiritual stuff. And... Uh, Anyway, so she gave me this videotape, and I looked at it, and it said, Anchor Ministries, The Marriage Covenant and Sexual Sin. Do you guys familiar with Anchor Ministries? Well, that video sat on my bookshelf for almost a year, and I, I'm, I'm a neat freak. So I'd go into my bedroom, and I'd look around. Is there anything in here I need to get rid of, any trash? And I'd see that video, and I'd go, I just need to throw that away. I'm, I don't have time to watch that garbage. And I'd pick it up to go put it in the trash can, and something would stop me from putting it in the trash can. I'd go back and stick it back on the shelf. Did that for a whole year. And finally, one Sabbath, I was at home by myself. My girlfriend was off doing something, don't know what. But the Lord made sure that I was home by myself. And I was sitting there, and I thought, what am I going to do? And I looked over, and that video was staring at me from the bookshelf. And I thought, you know, I need to throw that dumb thing away. What I'll do is I'll just stick it in for five minutes. That way I can say I watched it, and then I'll throw it away. Well, I put the video in, and two hours later, I was still sitting on the couch, and the Lord was speaking to me. 
And I got the phone number off the back of the video. And I made a phone call to Oregon to talk to Alan Collette. And um, I thank Yahweh that they were there. I thank him that they were there. They stayed on the phone with me for hours at a time, never asked me for a penny. They sent me videos, they sent me books, and they prayed with me nonstop. Anyway, during this time, I was still dating this girl, and the Lord obviously was working on my heart to break down those chains and to break those chains that I'd been caught in. And the girl was a nice girl, um, nice family. She hadn't done anything wrong, but it was me that was bringing sin into her life, not the other way around. And one night, I was taking her home, and I got in my car, and I asked her, I said, is it hot? And she said, no, it's fine. I mean, it was probably 65 degrees outside. It was a fall evening, and, uh, or I should say nighttime, and I started getting really hot. And I looked out of my window, and it looked like the sky was um, brown mixed with green. There was clouds, like a storm coming, but it looked green and yellow, I mean an ugly color. And then I started smelling something. I started smelling sulfur burning. You know what that smells like? We're driving down the highway, or in my neighborhood, and I'm looking out the window, and I'm getting hot. I mean, my skin was physically getting hot. And I was smelling this smell, and I was looking at the sky, and I started getting scared. And I asked her, I said, do you not feel that? Do you not see that? She said, I don't see anything. And then I looked over to the right out of my window, and there's a tree line. Because where I live, we have pretty good-sized mountains. There's this tree line on this hill, and you could see the glow of a fire as though the other side of the hill was burning and it was moving towards us. And all of a sudden, a picture flashed into my mind, something that my mom had taught me when I was a boy. And I thought, oh my goodness, Yeshua has already come. Jesus has already come, and he's cleaning the world with fire. And I thought, but wait a minute, how did I miss it? And this voice on my head said, it doesn't matter how, this is the end. This is when God is pouring out his judgment on the world. And you know what the one thing I could think about was? Where's my wife and my kids? And they were in Texas. I was in Tennessee. And I thought, I know my wife loves the Lord. I know my children love the Lord. I know that they're going to be okay. No matter what happens, I know that, that the Lord has got them. And I thought, and I'm dead. It doesn't matter what sin we commit. It doesn't matter how far have we fallen from grace? Each one of us here tonight know that if we get on our knees tomorrow and we tell him we're sorry and we ask him to forgive us, we have a second chance. Amen. What I felt that night was there is no second chance. When people see fire come down, when the wicked see that from heaven and the earth has begun to burn up, there's no second chance. Those people will never be able to cry out and say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it, I'm sorry. It will do no good. And I felt that like I've never, I had never experienced that in my life. And it, it scared me so much that right here in the middle of this road, at a four-way intersection, I was terrified. I stopped the car and I got out on the road and put my face on the ground and I put my hands over my head and I started wailing and gnashing my teeth. I've never done that. I'm not an emotional person. I don't get scared very easily. I mean, I've made all these ranks and all these. I was terrified. And she, the girl in the car, she was like, what are you doing? And she didn't see. She wasn't seeing what I was seeing in my mind. And I thought, and I was screaming. I was saying, God, save me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And then I thought, well, I can't save myself. My family's gone. At least I can try to get her home to see her parents before the fire gets here. So I got in the car. I drove you know, 90 miles an hour to get her to her house. She got to her house, and she was fine, but she was worried about me. And I went home. And on the way home, the Lord revealed something to me. He said, Eric, he said, I'm showing you where you're going to wind up if you keep on this road. He said, I'm letting you experience what you're going to experience if you stay on this road. That was when Heavenly Father started working in my life to set me free. That was the first time that my eyes began to be open. 
But that was only the beginning of the fight. Because I still had these, uh, do you guys know what soul ties are? When you become connected to somebody? Yes. I had soul ties to this girl. Even though we hadn't slept together, I still had soul ties to her that were very difficult to break. And I still had the ties that were righteous ties to my wife that aren't supposed to be broken. Anyway, I began to search because I was struggling with this battle within myself. And I began to search for answers. I began searching for answers about spiritual warfare. How do I get free? I'd spent my whole life in sin. Even when I was a Christian, I still had sins that I seemed like I couldn't get free from. And I started searching for answers. So while I'm doing all that, I'm still teaching martial arts. I was teaching a style called Bakwa. I was teaching uh, Chinese Qigong. I was teaching uh, Aikido and Kung Fu and boxing, all of these different things. One of the things that I taught was called Bakwa. And it was like Tai Chi. It was a slow moving form. But the form that we did, you always did the form in this pattern. You move the whole form, and when I say a form, it's like a series of movements. You walked around this circle doing these motions, and you would move your hands in certain motions, but you always went like so many times clockwise, so many times counterclockwise, and it was all done very slowly. And I was there one night, and I was teaching, and we were doing this form. There was about 10 or 12 of us there in the class, and while I was doing it, um, I was moving around the circle, and I looked, and I was watching, and there's 12 people in this circle. We've been doing it for 30 minutes, and they're all drenched. They are dripping in sweat. And all we did was walk no faster than this. We did that for 30 minutes, and everyone is drenched in sweat. And you think, wait a minute, how does that happen? They're not working out. How are they drenched in sweat? And now I looked at their eyes, and everyone looked like they were in a trance. And that's supposed to be a good thing in martial arts because you're like, that means that you're, t you're touching the chi or you're getting open to the chi so that energy can fill your body and your mind. Anyway, while I was there, Heavenly Father dropped a little bomb in my head. He said, Eric, he said, what would this look like if you were looking at it from my, pos my position? And I thought, huh, a crop circle, you all know what crop circles are? They don't look like anything except a mess to the farmer. But to a guy in an airplane, you can see the shape. And Heavenly Father said, Eric, what you're doing, this is what I see. And I thought, well, that's interesting, because I've seen that symbol in martial arts before. So I went home, and I went through all of my notebooks, things I had been taught, books that I had bought from other martial arts masters, and I looked up this symbol. And what I found shocked me. So I came to my, my class of advanced students, and I told them, I said, I want you guys to do some homework this week. I said, go find out what this symbol means. Because you can't tell somebody something. It's better if they find out for themselves. Because then they can't argue, because they already found out. So I told them, I said, go find out what this symbol means. They all went home that week, you know, excited about the homework and wanting to impress me with their, their knowledge. And they came back the next week, and all of them looked really solemn. And I asked them, I said, share. And we had about eight or ten students there in that class, advanced students, all of them found this symbol in different places. They found it in Chinese martial arts, Japanese martial arts. They found it in the occult. They found it in Wicca. They found it in um, gaming magazines. They found it in witchcraft books and Harry Potter books. and er They found it in all these different places, tattoo books. But you know what the symbol means? The sun god. Every single time they found it, that symbol means the sun god. Well, the Chinese say that's what yin and yang, or yin and yang, started off as. You had the center point and the outer point. And that symbol, that may be off, Joe. Can you advance it one? Okay, these are my, the little girl on the right is my daughter. Sierra, and the little boy on the left is my son, Connor, and that other little girl is sort of my adopted uh, child. That's my daughter's best friend. But they were the ones that were praying for me. Go ahead and fast forward a little bit more. That's my wife when we got remarried last August. And you can see the difference in my eyes there versus my eyes back when I got the black belt. Okay, go to the next one. I think we skipped a couple. 
Go forward a little bit more. Yeah, we skipped some. That's okay. Go back a little bit farther, a little bit farther, a little bit more, a little 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 more. There you go. Keep going. Keep going. All right, there. Go forward one. Thank you. I appreciate y'all being so patient. These are some of the other symbols for yin and yang. And I'm showing these to you because I want you all to start seeing them when you look at things. You'll start noticing symbols everywhere. Go forward one more. That's the same symbol, but just in a different representation. You see the three circles? Okay, go forward one more. There's the same symbol, but in a different shape. What's that symbol called? Swastika. You know, when I grew up, I thought the swastika was a German, like a Nazi symbol. It's not. Do you know the swastika came from Hinduism? It was there for 2,000 years before Hitler was ever even dreamed of. Now, I'm going to show you something. That right there was written by a Chinese man. Go forward one more, Joe. That is a Buddhist swastika, which represents the sun god. Go forward one more. And blow this one up. Do you see right there in the middle? See the swastika? And what is that around it? The sun. In the middle of a six-sided star. And I'm not even going to go into that because we could spend two days talking about that. I'm going to throw that out to you. Before you believe that that star of David that you see on the nation of Israel is for God, look up where that symbol came from before you believe that. Because the Jewish people didn't use that symbol until 150 years ago. They had never even seen it until 150 years ago. King David had never seen that six-sided triangle. That six-sided triangle is a triangle pointing up and a triangle pointing down, and they are joining. That's joining of male and female energy. That's a yin and yang. Okay, go forward. You can go forward one more. This was the symbol for the style that I developed over the past 25 years. Go forward one more. Again. Okay, that's my wife and my kids. Like I said, they were the ones that were, that were really praying for me. What I want to sh share with you now is, is what the Lord did to bring me out of the martial arts, out of what I was involved in. Not only was I involved in a relationship that I'd created very strong soul ties with a woman, um, but I had spent 25 years creating soul ties with martial arts masters. I think of a good way to put this. I'm going to try to recognize we have a mixed audience. I think most everybody in here is adults, though. Um, the way that the Chinese say that energy works is to produce something, you have to have a joining of male and female. The Bible says the same thing. Adam knew or was intimate with his wife, and they produced a son. When you think about that, the Chinese always say that energy, or qi, comes from the man. So you have the female, which is yin, and you have the male, which is yang. The male produces energy, and that energy is transferred to the female. And that, then the female um, nourishes that energy and produces a child. So by joining male and female together, you produce something. The Chinese idea with yin and yang is, is to take male and female energies and join them together in order to produce power or to produce uh, psychic abilities or the ability to do ESP or the ability to push people without touching them. This, um, this power of joining the male and female energies, when a man and a woman are joined, his spirit is transferred to her. That's why in the Bible it says the sins of the father are passed on to the son, to the third and fourth generation of them that hate him. From father to son, that's where that phrase comes from, like father, like son. If you look at a, a boy, you can see his dad. They have a lot of the same characteristics, the same mannerisms. It's because spirit is being passed. Now if the spirit that's in the dad is holy, God's spirit, Yahweh's spirit, 
then that is passed to the Son. It doesn't mean the Son's guaranteed salvation, but it means He has the Holy Spirit living in Him to work for His salvation. The problem is, though, in martial arts, you have a master, and you have a student or a disciple, and they're under that master. So the master is passing energy or spirit down to all of his students. And the master is receiving energy from his grandmaster, and his grandmaster is receiving energy or spirit from whatever the religion was that he believes in. So you have a pyramid, the person at the top, the grandmaster, and the energy or the spirit keeps being passed down till you get down to the little kids. Little kids that don't even know what they're doing, but they're still receiving the same spirit from that grandmaster as I was. So not only was I dealing with spiritual warfare and trying to become free from this relationship I had gotten involved in, but more strongly I was trying to fight for freedom from the martial arts. I began to pray after I saw that symbol and my students came back in and told me what they saw. They asked me, they said, what are we going to do? If that symbol's the sun god, what do we do about it? I told them, I said, well, we're not going to do that form anymore. And then I began searching for more. I thought, well, if I've been doing this for years and it's wrong, what about all the other stuff I've been doing? So I started searching, and I asked Heavenly Father, I said, I need an answer. But I need an answer from somebody that knows. I don't want an answer from uh, a hoot owl preacher up in the woods somewhere that's never done martial arts. Because in Tennessee, you've got all kinds of good old preachers, old-fashioned preachers that... You know, they yell and scream and thump the pulpit, and they may be right saying that martial arts is bad, but they don't know why because they've never done it. I didn't want to hear from somebody that had never done it. I needed to know from someone that had done it, like I had. And I asked Heavenly Father, it was on a Friday night, I went to my wife's house to use her computer, and I asked uh, Heavenly Father, I said, I need an answer. I need it to be so clear that I can't deny it. And in His mercy, even though I was not living for Him, in His mercy, He gave me that answer instantly. I typed in two words on the computer. I typed in Christian and Qigong, which was a type of martial art I was doing that dealt with chi. The first page that came up was a book written by a Chinese Qigong master that had become a Christian. He wrote a nine-chapter book explaining why the Chinese idea of chi was all from the devil. And I read that whole book in two nights. I sat there in front of that computer and I devoured that book because he was talking in the language that I was used to hearing. He was talking about things that I had been involved in and he was answering the questions that I had always had that no one else had been able to answer. That was in 2006. And I, after reading that book, I prayed about it. I said, Father, I said, I don't know how to do this, but I know what you want me to do. I went into my school. I wrote up on my chalkboard, we're going to have a, a big seminar you know, this Tuesday night, I want all my students to come. So I had, uh, had about three-quarters of my students show up. We had about 50 or 60 students show up. And they were all dressed, to, you know, to work out. And they didn't know what kind of seminar I was going to do. And what I did was I pulled out a chalkboard and I showed them everything I'd learned over the past few months about why the martial arts were wrong. I showed them what the martial arts taught, and then I put the scripture up there beside that, and I said... This is what the martial arts teaches. This is what Yahweh, God, teaches. And they're opposite, exact opposite. And I told my students that night, I said, I'm quitting martial arts. And it kind of uh, it floored a lot of the students because that year I had been inducted into the Martial Arts Hall of Fame. Um, I was growing in my martial arts. I was becoming more well-known. I was getting more opportunities with it. But I told them with tears in my eyes, I said, I'm quitting this because God Almighty has, has called me out of it. He has told me not to do this anymore. And I closed my school down. That was in August of 2007. I closed it down completely. Before I closed it down, I've got a couple more little, little things I need to tell you about. Before I closed the school down, there was an afternoon that I had a, a girl and her father. She was about 16 years old, 15, 16 years old, and her and her dad used to come take classes from me. Uh, family thing, you know, it's good to, to work out with your kids and do things with them. And he was a good Christian man. I knew him. I became good friends with him. But they came in and took the class, and then they left. And the moment that they left, 
I felt something in the room. And um, what I felt uh, felt very powerful. Have you ever been around a lion at the zoo? Have you ever heard one? You can feel their power, their presence. What I felt in my school that day, I was the only one there, I felt this presence that was very powerful but scary. And about that time, the UPS guy pulled up to the front door, and he came walking in with a package for me. And he gave me the package, and he told me how much it was for, and I pulled out my checkbook, and I started to write the check, and all of a sudden, I felt something inside of me that I had never felt before. I felt this rush, and it came from down here, and it rushed up. And the hair on my head, what little I have, it, everything on my body, all the hair on my body, it felt like was standing up on end like needles. And then I saw my hand writing, and I wasn't making it right. And I heard my voice talking to the UPS man, and I wasn't speaking. I felt like I was sitting in the back seat, and someone else was driving my car. I saw my hand doing this, and I saw me talking to a man, and I was sitting here quietly watching, and I didn't know what was happening. And the UPS guy walked out, never batted an eye, and I realized that something that I had invited into me was now wanting to manifest. Something that I had been involved with for all these years was manifesting in my life. And I picked up my Bible, and I went in the other room on my knees, and I, I begged Heavenly Father. I said, I need help right now. And Heavenly Father said, don't beg, believe. He said, believe. And I opened up that verse where it says, if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. And I started claiming that. And I started claiming the verse that says, get thee behind me, Satan. And the devil got behind him. And then I felt that tingling and that full feeling, I felt it start going down. And I walked to the front of the school with my Bible open, and I told all those spirits that I felt in that room, the ones that felt so powerful, I opened the door up and I told them to leave. And I physically felt them push by me when they were going out. Like someone was there, I felt my body move as they were leaving. What I didn't realize, though, was is the thing that had manifested itself in me didn't leave. It just went back down. It hid. It saw me pull out the sword, and it said, no, 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 no. I'm a nice guy. Don't fight. I'll hide. I'll be quiet. That, that same week or the week following, I came home. Uh, my wife and I were working on being back together now, and we were living in the same home again. And I came home, and it was late at night. It was probably 12, 1230. I'd had a late night at the school. And when I walked in, I walked into the kitchen, turned the light on. I was there by myself, and I thought, you know, my blood sugar's low because I've dealt with diabetes since I was 14 years old, which is kind of strange because that's the same time I started in martial arts. But um, I felt like my blood sugar was low. And I thought, well, I'm going to go get some grape juice out of the refrigerator. So I walked over to the refrigerator, and I opened the door, and every hair on the back of my neck stood up instantly, and I felt that same thing. I was afraid to turn around because I thought if I turn around, there's something huge. What I could feel, and I don't know how to describe this, but what I could feel was seven or eight feet tall. I felt something behind me that was enormous, and I was terrified. I couldn't even move. And I thought, what do all this martial arts do? I mean, I could fight five or six, you know, brown belts, well, like it was nothing. And here, I'm, I can't do anything. What good was all that martial arts if I'm terrified and I can't even move? And then I fell on my face, and I started pleading the blood of Jesus Christ. I kept saying, Father, forgive me. Father, give me strength. In the name of Jesus Christ, leave. In the name of Jesus Christ, leave. And after about four or five minutes of doing that, I felt it leave the room. Anyway, this had started really making me hungry to find out about spiritual warfare, because I'd spent 25 years in physical warfare, and I saw that that wasn't working. I said, I need to understand, I need to know how to perform spiritual warfare. What are the rules to this game? Because I'm facing these beings that I don't understand. I don't know how they fight. How do I win? Because you don't hear a lot about that in most churches. 
And um, I got online, and I typed up spiritual warfare, and I'd heard about this man that had written a book. His name was Vito Rollo. He wrote a book called Breaking Generational Curses and Pulling Down Strongholds. And uh, everyone that I'd seen you know, talk about spiritual warfare recommended his book. So I got on the computer, and I typed his name in and the name of the book, and it brought up a page. And I still had my school open at this point, but it brought up a page. And the first page had his name on it, but it had an article instead of the book. And you know what the name of the article was? What place does martial arts have in the church? <laughs> and when I saw that, I'd already quit teaching the chi and all that stuff, but when I saw that on that page, I thought, and I leaned back in my chair and I crossed my arms, and I, I looked up the, the sky and I said, Father, I said, I don't want to read this. <laughs> And Heavenly Father told me, he said, you know, you've got to make a choice. I'm leading you. Do you trust me? I said, all right, I'll read it. So I read that man's article, and I called him on the phone the next day. I said, I need to talk to you. He had spent 27 years in martial arts, and he had come out of it. He's now a pastor, and he now teaches spiritual warfare. I called him, and he spent a number of hours with me, praying with me and talking with me, helping me, teaching me about what to do and how to do it, and most of all, teaching me to believe what this says. He told me, he said, Eric, you have to believe it. And I said, well, I believe it. He said, but you have to know it. You have to know that you know that you know that it's real. Anyway, so as he began you know, working with me and praying for me to get me free from martial arts, I had a lady come in, and she brought a little boy in with her. And she told me, she said, her little boy had problems with discipline. She said, we don't know how to discipline him. He's five years old. He's not in school yet. We can't put him in kindergarten because we can't get him to sit still long enough to hold a pencil. And uh, she said, we need help. We think martial arts will be the answer. And she had him come in, and within two minutes, he had wrecked my school. He went over and got a magic marker and started writing on the walls, giggling at his mom, running from his mom, screaming and yelling, tearing things up. And I thought, there's no way in the world I want this kid in my class. Especially don't want him with other little kids because he's going to make them even crazier. And uh, anyway, I told her, I said, I'll teach him if you bring him by himself. I said, we'll try it one-on-one -on -one for a little while. And I'd been reading about spiritual warfare, and I'd been reading what Alan Collette had told me. And the mom, I asked her, I said, what is he diagnosed as? Is he uh, AD, ADD or ADHD? Um, and she said, no, he has been diagnosed with something called Osbergers. And Osbergers, the doctors say, is a form of autism, except it makes you hyperactive. And this little boy couldn't even walk. When he'd walk, he'd walk on his toes like this. And he would, uh, if you said something to him or told him to do something, he'd get this little gleam in his eye and he'd giggle at you. He was very intelligent, but he, he would not listen to anything that you said. So one day he's in there with his mom for class, and uh, he takes off, grabs the magic marker, and starts writing on the walls again. And I was tired of painting the walls. and So I called uh, Alan Collette. I said, what do I do? You know, I had no experience other than what I was doing in my own life. I said, what do I do about this kid? They said, pray. I said, pray. I mean, how many of you have prayed and actually not heard an answer? I mean, all of us have done it. You pray and you hope and you wish that you get an answer and you don't see an answer. I was like, I, I can't just pray. This kid's running around marking on my wall. Praying's not going to stop it. And Colette told, or Al told me something. He said, ask the angels of God to bring him back if he runs away. I said, you want me to do what? He said, ask the angels of God to bring him back if he runs away or if he starts acting up. And I said, what if they don't? And Al said, what do you mean, what if they don't? They will. I said, but how do you know that? He said, the Bible says so. The Bible says whatever we ask in the name of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, he will do. And I said, well, I know it says that, but it doesn't mean that. And he said, yes, it does. And I thought... Well, what's his mom going to say? What if he doesn't come back and his mom's standing there beside me? I'm going to look like an idiot and they're going to have me in the newspaper. And uh, he said, ask the mom if she's a Christian. Ask her if you can pray with the boy before each class. I said, okay. So she brought the little boy in the next week. 
And he started acting up really bad. And I asked her, I said, are you a believer? And she said, yes. And I said, have you ever prayed for him? She said, well, we pray for him, but it doesn't seem like it does any good. I said, well, would you care if we started praying before each class? And she looked at me kind of strange, and she said, well, I don't guess that'll hurt. And uh, so we knelt down right there in the middle of this martial arts school. God's mercy is great. We knelt down right there in the middle of this school, and she put the little boy on her lap, and I put my arm on his shoulder, and I began to pray for him. And he was sitting there kind of fidgeting. I knew he wasn't closing his eyes. He's just looking around. And when I got to the end of the prayer, I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, and he started growling. And this little boy, I mean, he was five years old. He started going, Arr! I mean, just growling, making this awful noise. And the moment that that happened, I opened my eyes. I looked at the mom, and her eyes were about this big. And I thought, okay, that, that tells me that we're not dealing with a physical problem. And, you know, you can't tell some mom, hey, I think your little boy's got... A demon bothering him. But she looked at me and she said, you know, what was that? I said, we just got to keep praying. So she brings him in the next week. And we do the same thing. We have prayer. And then in the middle of us teaching class, he takes off running across the room. And the room was probably about as long as this room. And she's standing beside me. I'm going to step away from the mic for a minute. She's standing beside me. And the little boy runs all the way back there. And I thought, what do I do? And then I heard what Al had said in my mind. The Holy Spirit brought it back to my mind. Ask the angels of Yahweh to bring him back. And I thought, I can't, because what if he doesn't come back? I'll look like an idiot. And Heavenly Father said, trust me. And so I whispered it. I didn't want to say it too loud. So I whispered. I said, angels of God, please bring him back. And the mom heard me. And the little boy was all the way back in that corner, and he was running the opposite direction. And this is what he did. And then he marched straight back and stood in front of me. And there's no humanly way possible that he could have heard my voice. And I almost fell over on the floor. I didn't even know what to say. And the mom, she was just stunned. That was another step that the Lord did in showing me that he was real. After that event happened, everything changed. I thought, my goodness, there's really angels here. And they really heard me. And they really did what I asked just so this little boy would be okay. And I, I was just amazed. I thought, how come? I've spent my whole life in Adventist churches. I've spent my whole life as a Christian. And this is, you know, I've not known about this. Anyway, there's a lot of other things that happened between then and now. But we closed the school down. My wife and I decided to drive down to Florida to meet that pastor that had been in martial arts. And uh, my wife and I, had, we had discussed the possibility of getting remarried, but I was still struggling with going back into what we had had before, and I still was trying to get rid of some of those soul ties to that other relationship. But we were discussing it, and uh, she told me, she said, well, we're going to Florida. Why don't we just take some nice clothes with us in case we decide to do something? And I laughed. I said, yeah, I said, that's a cute idea. You know, we're not going to get remarried now, but we're just going to go down here and meet this pastor. So we drove down. We got to his house on a, a Sabbath morning. And, uh, and they're not Sabbath keepers, but they are learning now. Um, but him and his wife invited me in, and they sat down with us for about seven hours and talked to us about what was keeping our marriage from being put back together. And we talked a little bit about martial arts, but they really focused on mine and my wife. What had caused the problem? You know, with me hearing a voice in my ear and her hearing a voice in her ear and us thinking that it was each other we were mad at, not realizing there were little things on our shoulders that were pulling the strings for us. The end of the day, the end of Sabbath, um, we were kind of wrapping things up and they asked if we wanted to go out and eat with them. And my wife raised her hand and she said, can I ask you guys a question? And we hadn't told anybody that we were even discussing getting remarried. And uh, she said, can I ask a question? And uh, Vito's wife, she raised her hand up, and she looked at her husband, and she got this big smile on her face. And she said, honey, don't worry about it. It's already taken care of. And my wife said, what do you mean? She said, which beach do you want to do it at? And I, I looked at her, and I said, what are you talking about? I said, how did you know? She said, the Lord told us that you two were going to get remarried this weekend. They already had everything set up. 
And those people weren't Sabbath keepers. That's a neat thing, isn't it? <laughs> um, so we went Sunday morning to the beach. First time in my life I'd ever been to the beach with my wife. I'd never taken a vacation before because I was in martial arts. I was married to martial arts, not to my family. We went to the beach Sunday morning, and this pastor and his wife married us. Joe, can you flip to that picture for me? But he married us there on the beach, and the only witnesses were my mom and my two kids. But it was the greatest feeling in the world to know that we have a father that cares that much about us. Now, a couple of things I want to tell you before we close. I know you guys have been really patient with me, and I'm getting a little long-winded when I tell this story. Tomorrow at church... There are some things that Heavenly Father has shared with me and that I've been in a lot of prayer about that He asked me to share with you guys. I've never been to the West Coast before. I, I have not been on a plane since I was five years old till the day before yesterday. And uh, I would really like to share some things with you tomorrow. And I would encourage you that if you're going to be here tomorrow, bring a piece of paper and a pencil, maybe five or six pieces of paper and a pencil. Um, because what I want to share tomorrow is how to have victory. I don't care if you're addicted to drugs, if you're addicted to cursing, if you're addicted to pornography, if you're addicted to food, if you're addicted to whatever sin, impatience, anger, yelling, scream, I don't care what it is. If you have something in your life that you know does not please Heavenly Father and you want freedom from it, I want to share with you what he shared with me. And I'm just like you guys. I'm still learning how to get victory every day. And as the Lord shows me how to get victory in one area of my life, I start saying, okay, wait a minute. If I overcame that through Jesus Christ, through Yeshua, I can overcome this. I want to share some things with you tomorrow that will help and it will change your life, I promise. And also, um, I think Joe and uh, the elders and the pastor here at the church won't mind Tomorrow, when we're doing this, if you guys have questions, ask questions. Because I, that's why I'm down here instead of being up there. I would rather us talk, sharing. I want to share with you some things. Um, the reason that I came this weekend was because when the Lord started pulling me out of the martial arts and I started learning, I started going back through my notebooks. I have 25 years worth of notes. I mean, stacks of notes that I wrote. I started going back through them and looking at all the stuff I'd learned, all the things I'd been taught, and then comparing them with Scripture and studying it. And Heavenly Father told me, He said, Eric, there's not any information out there about this. There's only one or two books that are any, of any value that are written about martial arts. And there's no videos. And I thought, you know, I'd rather watch a three-hour video as read a 600-page book any day. I can gain more and it's quicker. And I told Heavenly Father, I said, I'd like to make a video to help share the details about the martial arts and why it is occultic with people. And uh, I've never made a video before, had no idea how to do it, but I thought I can start doing the research and getting the information together. And there was one woman who did a video. Her name is Carol Matriciana. She lives here in California. She did a video about yoga and the church, about how yoga is being brought into the church. And I thought, I need to call her and ask her if she'd be willing to be interviewed for my film, which I've never made a film before. So I called her up and told her who I was and talked to her about what I was going through and what the Lord had brought me out of. And at the end of our conversation, she told me she would, uh, she'd be happy to be interviewed and she would you know, contact me back after she looked at her schedule. Well, she called me back a day or two later and she said, Eric, she said, I've been in prayer about this. How would you feel if I helped you make this film? And she spent the past 30 years doing Christian documentaries. And I said, that's the answer to prayer. I said, that'd be great. So this coming week, I'm going to be going down to uh, it's a place called Menifee near Sun City. And we're going to be finishing up the filming and the editing on the film that reveals the dark side of martial arts. Um, so what we're going to do is, is tomorrow I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but we're going to focus on the spiritual warfare and the victory, whether it be martial arts or one of those other things that we talked about, it can be applied there. 
But while I'm here, you guys really keep us in prayer while we make this film. Because the devil does not like this. This is the only film that's ever been made like this. I need you all support. Tomorrow when we come, like I said, bring some paper and pencil. Um, I'm also going to be bringing in some uh, handouts, and they're free. And we'll have a table set up in the back. Um, I've got handouts with Bible promises on it and with, with instructions on how to have victory on a daily basis, how to overcome whatever it is that's holding you in bondage. And when we put those things back in the back, you know, you guys make yourselves at home. If we don't have enough to go around, if you can share with somebody, I've made as many of them as I possibly could carry on the plane with me, so we may have to go get some more, you know, copies if we need it. But I'd love to see you guys tomorrow. And if you have any questions, like I said, we'll be here all day tomorrow. I'm, I'm, I believe we're supposed to be here till evening sometime. So if you have questions tomorrow, you all speak up. Raise your hand or yell at me or something, throw something at me, get my attention. Okay. I appreciate y'all listening and being so patient with me. Thank you so much, uh, Eric, uh, for coming all the way from Tennessee. Thank you, sir. Uh, the, uh, we also like to thank uh, Brother Joku uh, for making uh, the arrangement. It was uh, Brother Joku contact with you over the internet. I thank you very much, sir. Many of us sure have learned a lot tonight, including myself. This is a real, what's it called, eye opener for many of us. Before we conclude tonight, I want to remind our all our friends here and members that tomorrow we begin at 9:30 with half an hour Sabbath school lesson study, and then we will go right. I just wonder if we could please reverently stand as we talk with the Lord. Oh, Father God, you brought us here this evening because you have a purpose to learn that there is a spiritual warfare. This warfare, Lord, is beyond our capability to win unless you are with us. We know that the evil one is very, very powerful, but we are so thankful that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is more powerful than he is. Oh God, thank you for the deliverance that you have given to your son, Eric Wilson. Oh God, all of the 25 years that he had been under the control of the evil one. Oh God, in your mercy and your love, you have set him free. Thank you for giving him the opportunity to share the joy and assurance of your salvation. Help us now, Father, that all of us who may be struggling to overcome a certain sin, maybe a habit, whatever it is, Father, give us the victory that you have given to Eric. Thank you for answering our prayers, and please be with us now as we go back to our respective homes, because we ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.